Everyone wants to live an inspired life, yet so many people search for happiness following the footsteps of peers and taking advice from people who have different values and outcomes to which they're searching. There are people born into wealth, graduated from the best universities in the world, and there are people who have none of that and yet are living extraordinary lives full of fulfillment and reward. The purpose of this podcast is to share insights and strategies that allow you to question the status quo and think freely, so you can design your life and be who you want to be. We get one life. Time is our most valuable asset. I believe that when we're free and able to focus on meaningful work, we become better human beings. This is Always Free, and I'm your host, Jason Greystone. Welcome to the leading podcast for financial empowerment and wealth creation. Subscribe to this podcast so you don't miss an episode. You can connect with Jason on social media and subscribe to the Jason Greystone YouTube channel for weekly videos. Don't forget to also subscribe to the weekly newsletter to receive frequent educational content and action steps to help you design your life so you can be who you want to be. For news on all future events and updates, go to jasongreystone.com. Well, 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 welcome to the podcast, the first ever Always Free podcast. And if those of you listening uh, aren't aware, this really span off of a, of a newsletter that I started writing called Always Free. And the feedback that I got from the newsletter was so incredible. I was receiving letters and emails and uh, DMs just really just letting me know how the information in that newsletter has had a significant impact on people's lives and even transformed their lives to the degree that they never ever thought possible. So I decided we need to make something bigger out of this newsletter and spread the message to more people. And I appreciate that not everybody reads. I've got people that follow me who are dyslexic. So I thought this is another platform where you don't have to read, you don't have to sit in one place, you can take me in the car, you can listen to me on the gym, uh, on the gym session, you can listen to me on the train, on your commute to work, and get value that way. So I can share uh, the tips and the insights and the strategies that I've shared in the newsletter with you guys as well. And it also gives another spin because I think when you can hear my voice and you can really connect with the passion and the enthusiasm that I've got for putting out this kind of of information that's really transformed my life, I think you can connect on a different on a different level. So I'm really excited about it. So before we get stuck in, um, I'm going to just briefly explain to those of you who've stumbled across this podcast who I am. Um, you kn- heard in the intro, my name's Jason Greystone, uh, but what? who am I? You know, why, why listen to this podcast? So I want to just share with you sort of where I'm at and uh, what has led me to this, to this podcast and why I think you'll get value from it. Uh, but essentially, I've, my name's Jason Greystone, as you heard in the intro. Uh, I've run multi-million pound businesses online and offline. So I've built multi-million pound revenue businesses, uh, both online and offline in the service sector. Um, I strategically replaced my income using some simple saving, investment and trading strategies, uh, which allowed me to achieve a level of financial independence that I, I literally knew I didn't even know existed when I was a kid. So um, I'm going to be sharing with you guys how exactly how I did that. Um, since then, I've built, I've co-built a, a very, very well-respected global online education platform for traders and investors. And since we've done that, we've been recognized by the likes of Forbes magazine. We've worked with some of the industry leaders uh, for the innovative work that we're doing with trading education and I'm also a business investor so I invest in businesses nowadays as well. So on top of all that I'm I'm really passionate about entrepreneurship, doing meaningful work and really figuring out what it is that you like doing and going all in and doubling down on that and of course not many people get the chance to do that and I was able to do that so I want to share with you exactly how I did that. So over the course of this podcast, I'm really going to be sharing with you sort of where I came from, um, the the insights and things that I've learned along the way that shifted my mindset. A lot of the podcast will be based on uh, mindset and myths and traps that people fall into because, of course, if we're 
if we want to achieve financial independence, if we want to achieve any kind of freedom, um, you know, whether it's just going against the grain, whether it's whatever job you go for, whatever partner you choose, what colour you dye your hair, what clothing style, you know, your image, uh, it, it takes courage and it takes a, a shift in the mind to go against the masses and really, really be yourself. So uh, a lot of it is heavily mindset. And then I'm going to be sharing with you all the transferable strategies and tips um, and just the way that I think uh, nowadays that's allowed me to take certain paths, certain journeys that have really paid off in my life. So hopefully you're going to enjoy what I have to say. And if you just take away one nugget, well, then I've succeeded in this podcast. So this podcast is going to come out very, very frequently. We're going to go for uh, weekly to fortnightly. It's going to be released. And obviously, when they're all up, you're going to have access to them forever. So I just want to take you back to uh, where I started and who I am, because of course this is the pilot episode and I really want to take you on the journey, and if I want to start sharing information with you, I think it's right that you know a bit more, you go a bit deeper into who I am and sort of why why the information I'm, I'm talking about with you guys is valuable at all, because you know there's lots of gurus online and there's lots of Oh, you know, it's it's full of, it's a very noisy marketplace in terms of coaches and mentors and all that kind of stuff. So I think it's, I really want to take this opportunity in this podcast to, to sort of give you a real connection with me so that you can understand how I've developed these insights, how I've developed these strategies and, and, and why I'm so passionate about sharing them with you guys. So let me just take you back to... Uh, when I was a kid, because when I was born, um, I was born on a, a, a council estate in South London, um, in a little place called Morden. And those of you who know Morden, I grew, I, I was born around the St Helier estate, so a uh, big old estate. And then I was bo- I was born in St Helier Hospital, and then we, um, me and my mum moved on to a, a, a housing estate in Grand Drive. And then we moved on, we swapped with my nan and I grew up on an estate called Hatfield Mead, which is in Morden in Surrey. And I lived there till I was 18. When I was born, it was just me and my mum because my, my dad had, uh, you know, my dad was a bit of a, a wrong and he had gone off and, and met other women. And, you know, it turns out I've got a sister who's like the same age as me as well with another woman. And whilst my mum was pregnant with me, he had another woman pregnant, all that kind of stuff. So it was really just me and my mum from the outset. And mum had me when she was, uh, she fell pregnant when she was 17 and had me when I was eight, when she was 18. So we immediately went into, you know, we lived with my nan for a little while. Then we we got a a council flat and I was pretty much just me and my mum. We grew up, you know, on the estate um, until I was about six when she met my stepdad. Now, because of the situation, you know, the, my, my stepdad was an electrician and my mum couldn't work because she was looking after me full time. Uh, we didn't have much money, you know, we didn't have too much, uh, didn't have too much money. I would always, you know, ha- go to school with sort of the budget food and we, we, we never had anything lavish. We didn't go on a holiday. Our first holiday I had when I was 13 or 14 years old. And we certainly didn't have uh, a frivolous uh, lifestyle at all. We grew up on this estate and and we were surrounded by a, a mismatch of, of people. Now, one thing I learned very early on was that there was lots and lots of people on the estate that I grew up on. And there was all sorts of walks of life. There was, uh, you know, the druggies who were like the worst kept secret in the world. They were... You know, they were sniffing all the profits up their nose and everyone knew they were dealing drugs. So it was like the worst uh, operation in the world. And then there was like the single mums and single dads that lived on the estate with the kids. Uh, They typically were on sort of kind of welfare benefits kind of thing and sort of supporting their children, full-time parents. Then there was like these really miserable old people on the estate and they were the, the ones who were like 
growing old alone where they were so bitter and miserable and they didn't really have many visitors. They were the ones that were complaining about the ball games and all that stuff when we were messing around as kids. And then there was like the people that did have jobs. So there was a guy who was a postman. There was a guy who uh, who worked in a bar as a, as a bouncer. And there was sort of all this sort of mismatch of people. And what I realised was is no matter what type of walk of life these people were from, we all used to sit at the base of the uh, estate on these steps every Friday night and we would converse and so I was quite, you know, I was interested in what everyone was up to. I was about, you know, I remember being 10, 11, 12, being quite nosy, interested in what the adults were saying and they were always moaning about money. So no matter what they were doing, whether they were a single parent, whether they were old, whether they were uh, druggies and drug dealers, whether they were, um, you know, even working, they would all be unhappy when it come to money. They would moan about this thing called money all the time. It was like the bane of their life. But what I noticed was, is every Friday they would get together and they would chip in and they would give, you know, they would give a round of cash to a guy called Roy who would collect all the money and he would go off and he would buy lottery tickets. So they were doing this syndicate lottery and what I saw was a load of people moaning about money, complaining about money, and yet they were all trying to win it. And very, you know, when I was very young, I started to question why these people were trying to obtain something that they thought was evil. They always used to have these negative views towards money. They used to think, oh, money's evil, you know, money's rich people are greedy and all this kind of thing. And they had this self-entitlement and, and, and they used to say how they should win, you know, how it's not fair that other people win the lottery and they should win the lottery and all this kind of stuff. So I very, uh, you know, I quickly um, picked up on that and just to just to sort of fast forward when i started to develop my own business and started to i sort of broke away started to self develop and um and i'll go back to to that in just a sec but when i when i started to self develop and hang around uh, successful people and i i would i would find that there was some wildly successful people who i thought were really successful you know they had all the money they had all the cars they had all the the watches the holidays the you know the 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 house the the lifestyle and um they were there were some of them were really really unhappy there was one guy that actually uh killed himself and i was looking around and there were celebrities killing themselves and all this kind of thing and i remember thinking you know there's something missing there's the, there's this isn't the whole story there's not there's there can't be you know they've got people that are unhappy because they don't have money and then there's people with money that are still unhappy so I started, you know, I really, I really became interested in it and, and obsessed with figuring out why, why people were still unhappy who appeared to be unhappy when they had everything and those who appeared to be unhappy about money when they didn't have any and, and, and all this kind of thing. So I started to question things very, very early on growing up on this estate and I was I was kind of the kid that was in class you know I know many kids do this but you know why why do we have to learn algebra why do we have to learn about um you know T.S. Eliot why do we have to learn about Shakespeare and why do we have to learn geography and all this kind of thing and I used to question everything I used to question all of the um why people would moan about money you know why people would still do the lottery and I was looking around on the estate and I just realized that something's wrong. You know, something is fundamentally wrong. When people want to, uh, they're moaning about something that they want. Um, and I just realized that I didn't want that. I didn't want to be moaning and complaining about something that actually it seems that you need. It seems that you need money. I didn't know why at the time. I was very young. Uh, but I just knew that I wanted to question and find my own answer. I didn't want, everyone else seemed to be basing this opinion off of what they had heard, and I didn't want to do that. And everyone was sort of under this impression that if you had, if you did want money, um, you certainly had to, 
you know, you had to have uh, been born at the end of a of a ray a rainbow, you know, with a pot of gold. You had to kind of be born smart. You had to get a good education, get good grades, and then go to university, and then get a good job, and then. If you got a good job, you then you had to save, and then you had to get promotions, and then you had to sort of climb this corporate ladder until you was uh, a, an important person inside the, the the company. And then one day, hopefully, you would become this rich uh, millionaire type person. And then you would uh, then you would be able to live the lifestyle. And you're sort of talking 30, 40 years uh, into your career, and that was kind of what everyone believed and no one thought they were good enough to do that. And when I realized that the how, that's how everyone was thinking, I just decided that that wasn't for me. I wasn't going to go down that path. I was going to try and find out what was going on. I was going to try and, you know, make up my own mind about where I wanted to go and what was right for me and really just take my own path. So, I started to behave very differently. I was looking around at everyone and I, I really didn't want to be like them when I grew up and I knew that I didn't. So I started to act differently. I started to talk differently. I remember sitting on the steps one Friday and there was, we had this neighbor called Denise and she had literally no teeth in her head. Uh, that's why I remember her. And I remember her talking to me and she said, you don't really talk like your parents. You don't talk like your mum. You would never know that your, your mum's son and I said well that's because I don't really want to be uh, like my parents I don't want to be like them and I didn't mean it as like in a nasty way I just didn't want to be in their position when I grew up so I figured that if I could be different as a kid then I could start to build different habits and I could live a different lifestyle when I was older but I didn't really know any more than that I just knew that I didn't want to be like them so the first time that I ever had any kind of um, light bulb moment, if you like, um, was when I was 13 years old. We grew up on, on this estate and it was the summer, it was about April, May time, coming up for the summer. And in, the, in October would have been my 14th birthday and I really, really wanted this BMX bike. Uh, it was a mongoose menace, uh, mongoose sniper, sorry, the chrome mongoose sniper, and it had the gyro. The menace was the one down, but the sniper had the gyro where you could spin the handlebars around. And I really wanted this bike. I'd, I'd, I'd never wanted anything more uh, than this bike. I went down to a, a family run shop, bike shop in Sutton, in Surrey, called Pearson's, and I think it's still there today. And they had two of these bikes in the shop. And I remember looking at these bikes and it was like the best thing I'd ever, ever seen. So I took away a brochure that had a picture of the bikes in there and I said, could I borrow this brochure? And he said, yeah, sure, you can, you can borrow the brochure. And I took it to a little video shop down in, in, in a place called Green Lane where I grew up and they had a, a photocopier, a black and white photocopier. So I had about, you know, I had a 50p or a pound or something, and I got all these photocopies done of the bike, the page with the bike on it. And I took the brochure back, but I had about 10 or 12 of these photocopies of the bike made up. And I went home and I sort of put them as subtle hints <laughs> inside my house. So I had them everywhere. I had them under my mum's pillow. I put them in the food cupboard. I put them in the fridge. Uh, I had one pinned on my ceiling so I could watch it every day. Um, I sort of hid them everywhere just to give my parents the hint that I wanted this bike. And my dad sort of, my stepdad kind of got the hint. He was like, all right, yeah, I get, I get you want this bike, but how much is it? And I said, well, it's 200 pounds. And he said, well, we can't afford 200 pounds, but I tell you what, your birthday's in October. If you raise half, I'll pay the other half. And I didn't know how or what, where or you know, how I could get this money, but I just agreed to it. I said, absolutely, you're on, like, this is it. I'll, I'll get half the money, I'll get £100, you get, and you match it, that's great, you're on, deal. So we sort of shook on this deal, and I had no idea how I was going to earn £100. I was 13 years old, I'd never earned money before, um, I didn't know anything about business, I didn't know how to get money, but, you know, what kid wouldn't agree to it? It's just something 
you, you agreed to. I wanted the bike so bad, so we agreed. So the next day I was looking around uh, the estate and I thought, well, you know, the obvious thing to do is go and wash cars. Now in the middle of the estate, there was this green. It was a triangular green and all the cars used to be parked around the green. Everyone that had a car on the estate used to park around the green. So, you know, it was a very easy target for me. I thought I'll go and wash some cars. So the next weekend came, the Saturday came and I thought, right, today's the day, I'll get a bucket of water, I'll go and start washing cars around this green. So I started knocking at doors, asking people if they wanted their car washed and quite a few people said no. And finally, this woman called Lynn, uh, who lived on the corner, she said, yep, you can wash my car, absolutely fine. And she had this white, it was her husband's car, it was a white Golf, it was all done up to the nines, very, very smart, sporty Golf, Volkswagen Golf. And um, and I was like over the moon that someone had agreed to allow me to wash the car. Because I thought, you know, this is the first step, I'm going to get the first step towards um, getting some money towards my bike. And if I could just get one of these a day, I'll be there in no time, right? So. I spent a long, long time washing that car. What I didn't want to do is have any reason for them to have a complaint or knock me for the money or say, oh no, you know, I'm not quite happy with it. So I spent like three hours washing this car. I got all the squeegee out. I've done all the windows with window cleaner and, you know, got the newspaper and really rubbed all the smears off the windows. It was a proper job, really good job. And it was just getting dark and I sort of knocked on the door and I said, Lynn, I've, uh, I've finished, would you like to take a look? And she was like, yeah, looks great. You know, here's, uh, here's five pounds. I was charging five pounds a car and she gave me two pounds tip. So I had seven pounds, one car, seven pounds. And I was literally over the moon. So I went up to my, uh, I went up for some dinner and my friend Lloyd came round. And that night I was talking about, you know, my plans to save for the bike and how I was going to go out the next day and wash some cars. And he said, look, I'll, I'll give you a hand if you want to help washing cars. And I said, yeah, that would be amazing. Like, I'll, 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 But the only thing is I can't really pay you at the moment because I'm, I'm trying to get more money so that I can get the bike. So I'm not sure how that's going to work. And he didn't really care. He just, he was up for giving me a hand. And at that moment my dad came in the room and he said, I'm just popping to the supermarket, would you like anything from the supermarket? And I don't know what really came over me, but this was a real turning point uh, for me. I had the seven pounds, okay, and my dad came in and said, would you like anything from the supermarket? And I something made me give him the entire seven pounds. So I was giving away everything I'd earned on day one, right so I, I really wanted this bike i earned seven pounds and now i had the seven pounds and i gave my dad the entire seven pounds and i said could you get me another bucket another sponge and a squeegee uh, if you've got enough can you get me a squeegee and he said okay what's that for and i said well tomorrow i want lloyd to be able to help me wash the car um so we can wash more cars and and he said okay he came back and the next day uh, Lloyd came out with me, we had two buckets, two sponges, and we went out and washed four cars. So we got four cars that day, um, I paid Lloyd a little bit of money, and I thought this is really good, you know, this is, this is amazing, like we've done four cars now, with two people, how many can we do if someone else wants to help? And very quickly it cottoned on, we had, you know, uh, there was Jason, Jack, Gareth, they were all interested in washing these cars with us. And by the end of the summer, I had four people washing cars. So I had four people washing cars. We were doing, you know, five pounds a car plus any tips. And I was not even washing the cars by that point. I was just going around um, making the sows and sort of collecting the money, if you like. And I wasn't hands on on the cars. And that was the real epiphany for me. That was a real turning point when I realized that if you, if you spend money in the right way and you invest money the right way and you use money to get more money, you can actually accelerate the amount of money and the amount of wealth that you can accumulate uh, if you use it the right way. 
So not if, you, if you're wise about how you spend your money, you can actually get more money. And that was my first taste for business on how to uh, create efficient income and how to kind of invest your money in the right way. And it changed me. It definitely changed me. So it was a true turning point for me in terms of how to invest money into a business. It was really my first business. Uh, I did phenomenally well. We ended up getting enough for the bike within, you know, sort of six or seven weeks as opposed to waiting from April to October, which was essentially five or six months. Um, and I didn't actually grow the business any further, but I realized that this is like a blueprint. If I can just stamp this on this green on this estate well I could go to the next block and do that block and get some people washing cars around there and I could go and get you know and it was almost like you could cookie cutter this team of car washing uh, kids onto different estates and, and really just grow this empire and that 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 really excited me that that kind of really excited me the, the thought of being able to scale something like that and create money from not actually doing your work yourself so massive turning point for me i wasn't the best student when it came to uh, school so i did terrible at school i was actually uh, had a bad experience for the last year of my school i was bullied um ended up sort of spending lunch breaks in the t in the toilet eating my lunch leaving school early i had a bad bad experience towards the end of school but up until the end of school I was one of these kids that I always thought that I didn't really get it. I thought I was the only kid in the classroom that didn't understand things. Information didn't go in very easily. Uh, I used to ask a lot of questions to the teachers, but whatever I asked, it just didn't seem to click. And then there were certain teachers that it would click, and there was most teachers where it wouldn't click. And uh, I just had, I just was a terrible uh, student. I didn't really. I was a bit of a class joker, you know. I didn't. I had a, a very short attention span, and I just wanted to, you know, I just wanted to, I, I just didn't understand why we were learning some of the stuff we were learning. And due to all of that, I ended up getting pretty poor grades in my GCSEs. I passed one with an A, um, and then really the rest were all sort of C, D, and below, um, and I didn't really have enough grades to get any kind of what I thought was the the best, you know, the best education to get into the best colleges or the best universities. So I decided that I wanted to become a fireman. But when I left school, I wanted to be a fireman. But I also wanted I knew that as a fireman, I would have four days uh, on and four days off and then four nights on and four nights off. So I thought, well, I can also get some kind of trade. I can get some kind of skill that I can use to maybe earn some more money on my time off from the fire brigade. So that's when I decided to become an electrical engineer uh, working for a company that my dad got me and my stepdad got me a job with. Um, so I did that. So I went into college and I became an electrical engineer. And really that's when I started. That was really the first job. Is actually the first and only job that I've ever had uh, to this day, but I went out and, and started being becoming this electrical engineer and, and building a career out of that. So I wanted to be a fireman. I had my life planned. I wanted to be a fireman. Uh, I knew I had this skill where I could create a little business and earn some money on the side. So I thought, well, if I get a trade and I could get a job and build up my skills in that area, maybe I can build a business in that. And I kept applying for the fire brigade and I kept getting knocked back at the time. It was very, very hard. They were taking on very select people. They were being hit for uh, equality. So they were taking on lots of women and lots of you know ethnic people and, and kind of start trying to keep everyone happy because they were getting they were getting it in the neck from the from the press and everything. So they were trying to please everyone. And although I was getting the best results on the tests and the bleep test and the, the interview and all that kind of stuff, they, they kept telling me that I've failed on the interview uh, and they've had to let in some other people. And I just, I kept going for it, I kept going for it. But by the time that I actually got accepted in, I was earning more money as an electrical engineer than I would be in the fire brigade. And at that point, I made a decision that, actually the fire brigade isn't for me instead I want to 
I want to go and, and do this full time because I know that I can use my skills that I used in the car wash business to build a business uh, in electrical engineering. And that's exactly what I did. I started a business in my shed um, and I scaled that business up um, as part of a strategy to replace uh, my income to become financially independent. And that's what I'm going to be talking to you about um, in the next episode. I'm going to be talking to you about um, how I used that business, how I became frustrated in that industry, and how I really um, started to put a plan in place, a solid plan in place, to be able to replace the income and not be reliant on an income from any business, uh, let alone that business, but anyone, um, and really start to free up my time to be able to think about what I wanted to do and who I wanted to be. So since then, um, I've obviously studied lots and lots of people. I've read over 600 books. I've, I've studied Warren Buffett, Kiyosaki, Tony Robbins, Ben Graham. I'm a big fan of Carol Dweck, John Demartini, Brian Tracy, uh, many, many different authors I'm, I've studied and I'm a massive fan of. And I've found out a lot of stuff that didn't work and a lot of stuff that does work and I've got a zero fluff rule so everything that you hear inside this podcast is not going to be gimmicky it's not going to be fluff it's going to be stuff that I've actually tried and tested and successfully implemented and it's made an impact in my life so I'm going to the way this podcast is going to work from now on we're going to discuss mindset we're going to discuss wealth accumulation wealth acceleration how to obtain uh, freedom, financial freedom, financial independence, uh, you know, real tangible strategies that you can use, not just this fluff and this guru strategy. These are real, real strategies that have worked for me. And then I'm going to be sharing with you some action steps in what I call the wealth inspiration. So uh, inspiration comes from, you know, you feel inspired and motivated when you take action. Um, and action makes you feel like you're making progress, which then gives you more motivation, you build momentum, and you start getting results. So there's a, the action steps are going to be at the end of each podcast. I'm really, really excited to share with you this podcast. So each week, um, I look forward to talking to you guys. Hopefully that gives you a bit of an insight into my, my background and sort of a, a little, you know, it gives you a little... Um, look into where I came from and how I grew up so you can see that I'm not you know I wasn't born into wealth I wasn't gifted I wasn't um, you know I wasn't born under a, a, at the end of a rainbow or anything like that and really I just shared that story just to sort of connect with you guys you listeners so that we can go through the journey on this podcast together without you thinking oh who is this you know this jumped up online guru (laughs) because i'm just a regular guy from south london so thanks for listening to the first podcast guys i look forward to seeing you in the next one and um, until then have a great day evening afternoon whatever it is where you are and i'll see you then to this podcast so you don't miss an episode.